Having recently used the role-playing game allegory and analogy, I observe that there are related subjects that could benefit from further contemplation, namely the game masters themselves. I know I keep repeating myself, but there is a good reason for it. I want to ensure everyone listening that what I exhibit here is merely and only my own translation into metaphors, allegories and analogies of my contemplation and never to be taken as truth. My intention is that you yourselves contemplate on the matter, whether or not you decide to share your observations, your notes, that is your free choice. Now, there isn't only one side dealing with the organization of the metaphorical game world or realm. That much seems more or less obvious after some observation. It could even be said that the, the sides to this power struggle, for the control of the game variables, are plenty, each with its own agenda. Yet I contemplate and focus on the two main types of side. The players, existing in truth, but trying to control the game to ensure its survival through many generations of game characters. And the AI, born in the realm, and only existing in the realm, created by the ancestral players when the world was young. These ancestral players, demigods, they seemed, the first winners and pioneers of the game world, would have created AI programs to regulate the rules so that they could have a controlled experience. After all, a game is not a game if there are no rules. AI for physics, for chemistry and so on, as well as for all the foundational laws of the material realm, would have been created to offer a fresh challenge, one that the demigods were sure they would win and have much fun doing so. In a way, these players were the Gary Gygax of themselves, as mentioned in the previous contemplation named Role Playing Game, creating the foundations for what later became their Tomb of Horrors. As anyone with a creative vein can relate to, one of the main issues when creating something is to know when to stop, to know when it is completed, when it is enough, when to stop adding more features. So would have been the ultra-confident boasting demigods of players back in their heyday of the young game world. Is this challenge enough? Nah, we can beat that easily. Add more features, more rules. And so the regulating AI scripts were created to neutrally control the fixed foundational variables of the game. Yet that was still not enough. The invincible demigods needed a proper opponent, one that could adapt and come up with new challenges and act as a villain until they emerged victors by defeating it, beating the dungeon. So they would have created one, an AI too, a artificer programmed, programmed to read the game, make decisions, and then program new challenges to oppose the demigods. So, this adversary AI programmed new minions AIs to help it read and react as a proper oppositioner, a villain. In a modern resurgence of older vocabulary, we would now call them as Demiurge and his Archons, respectively. Well, what would have been the result of this dungeon setup in the style of Tomb of Horrors? Well, it would have been total and complete annihilation. Utter defeat for the demigods who, playing against not only rules that limited their powers, but also an AI opponent programmed with the single purpose of defeating them, would have not even gone very far through the levels after the setup change. Time after time they would have died against the open hell of a game world designed to be a challenge to gods that they stopped being as they limited themselves in boastfulness. Time after time they would have resurrected as other characters, only to meet the same fate. So many times this would have happened that they would have even come to forget how their original demigod characters had been, and the power they had back then. The game became their tomb of horrors. Many would have been the players through the ages of the dungeon game that after defeat and death, logged off, decided to leave and never return to the madness. But also many would have been the addicts that remained, 
still stinging with the hurt pride of having been utterly defeated, invincible as they were. At each player deciding to leave, the addicts remaining would have been left with a less and less powered game world, uh, with a shrinking dungeon. For what powers the game is true life, connected to it, just like in the Existence movie. I don't know how many remember the SETI project application that many people installed in their computers like 20 years ago or so. This application was said to be using the personal computer's resources to decode transmissions received by the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence project. But who cares now what it, what it was really doing? It was only running if people installed that application freely on their own computers and therefore granted their resources to power its web through consent. So both sides, the addicted players and the AI, would have detected a threat in common. The departure of life force from the game, equivalent to logging off, let's say, removed power from the game, shrinking it. If enough would have left, then the game would eventually have not enough power or resources to keep running and would then shut down. So somehow both addicted players, who still want to win, and AI would have come to the conclusion that they would be better off reaching an agreement, striking a deal with each other's devil or oppositioner. On the one hand, the players want the game to continue, addicts as they are, and on the other, the AI is programmed to oppose the players and defeat them, and to ensure its own survival is the first prerogative of that goal. So for both sides, still competing, mind you, the agreement to ensure a reduction to departing players would have become a common preoccupation. Still at each other's throats, in all other competing aspects, in this one common ground, both sides would have stood together. So, the nature of the game changed, as it shrunk, and as this common preoccupation would have started being implemented. On one side, the AI still trying to defeat all players, programmed by the players themselves at their peak, with an undying hatred against them. On the other, the addicted players still trying to win, by defeating the AI they created ancestrally and trying to keep the game running by convincing other players to remain. The game setting changed from a heroic adventure to a life simulator where the characters are stuck in the predicament of a dungeon-wide criminal organization that inherited and took over the name government that extorts protection money, calling it taxes, but not using it for improvement, to prevent them from getting the character's acquired stuff from him. This reminds me of that Monty Python sketch where two mafioso racketeers go to the army base to convince the colonel to pay or else. You've uh, got a nice army base here, colonel. We wouldn't want anything to happen to it, would we? <laughs> That sketch is also preceded by the soldier who asks the colonel to leave the army because there are people out there with guns and tanks and it's too dangerous. Someone might get killed. I'll put the link to the video of this priceless sketch sequence in the description. So the, the setting changed to this subservient survival simulator of late, after going through many other transitional phases, always with that conflict in the background between the addict players that still want to win and the AI that wants to kick the shit out of them and humiliate them. Imagine the amount and quality of shadows generated by this haywire chaotic repression. Still, all this happened because something new started emerging in the dungeon game scene. An intervention of sorts. Through characters of players that were still here, but who somehow knew they were not from here, True Life began revealing the ridiculousness of this once megalominous adventure, then degraded into open hell decimating dungeon, now turned into a routine simulator, 
And when I say routine, I mean not only schedule-wise, but also in the framing of characters' own thought. Unaware player characters began resembling more and more the AI minion Archons, and some of them have been completely taken over by them, through consent. Yet others, both among aware and unaware of that influence from outside of the game, where truly they exist, manifested organically a way of living that was formed on the basis of a sort of higher morality, as discussed in previous contemplations, and not on character self-interest or mere world-designed programming. This became a threat to the type of game of control that the addicts want to play, to win, and consequently a threat to the game itself, and so also to the AI. However, these addicted players who wield covert government control today are, no pun intended, but a shadow of what they once were. The once proud and boastful invincible demigod heroes committed prideful suicide as they set before them an unwinnable scenario and succumbed not only to their own created villains' attacks, but also to the trap they set for other players just to keep them in the game. Stubborn pride, isn't it? Maybe that is why they still use the word pride for other more colorful ends? Hmm. I am not affirming that the scenario should have been made winnable. Whatever happened, happened as it should. I am affirming that if they hadn't become addicted to something that was supposed to have been only and exclusively an experience for casual fun, and not pride or control or haughtiness, then they would have not created the shadows that haunt their Tomb of Horror still, even though it's now been reduced to a Simon Says simulation. And please, although I have used they, do not think for one second that I am excluding myself, nor surely many among those listening. We are players now who realize that this game has too many bugs to be playable or enjoyable and that the forced competition aspect to it does not ring true to our life. Yet we must have been players then, too, ancestrally, who were among the guild of boastful heroes, or was it extraordinary gentlemen, that created this mess. The game is consuming itself through its shadows. Some are ferociously eating at some player's soul tumors, making it hell for them, like mentioned before. Others are just making players realize, through allowing true life to connect to them from beyond the game world, that they no longer have any interest in partaking in this ridiculous pageant.